page. Yep. Uh, we're getting some text messages from students that the link is not working. So maybe the email you send this morning, if you don't mind sending it to the School of Public Health list server. Uh, yeah, give us just a second. All right, we are resending that out now. So um, we'll give everybody here just a second. But in the meantime, I would uh, like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Paul McKinney. He's our professor and associate dean for research at the University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. Thanks very much and good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the third presentation of our four-part Woodson lecture series. We are very grateful to Dr. McCormick who'll be sharing his experiences in global public health over the past 50 years with us today. I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge that the series is being funded by the Woodson Lectureship Endowment, which was established with an, anon an anonymous gift in 2014. I'd also like to thank the leaders of the school's Student Government Association, who were instrumental in pulling together the webinar series, as well as the team in the Office of External Affairs for handling the event promotion and registration activities for today. And now I will turn it over to uh, Daniel Malik, an MPH student, vice president of our Student Government Association, who will introduce Dr. McCormick. Daniel. Thank you, Dr. McKinney. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. McCormick, who was the founding dean at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health. He was also the dean for over 18 years and currently holds a James Steele DBM professorship at the UT Health School of Public Health in Brownsville. He earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry and mathematics from Florida Southern College and master's in science from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and an MD from Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. McCormick's junior career spans decades, countries, and organizations. He is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards a member of several scientific organizations, has published hundreds of scientific publications and worked with co-authors from over 20 different countries. Dr. McCormick and his wife, Susan, published an account of their journal tracking viruses in level four virus hunter of CDC, which has been published in eight languages. SGA has also provided a copy of the book to the first 50 people who have registered. Without further ado, I present Dr. Joseph McCormick. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, yeah, good. All right, so today I'm going to, rather than give you a, a, a specific scientific focus, scientific lecture, I'm gonna talk about my own uh, adventures in public health over now a very long period of time, uh, just to give you a taste of the kinds of things you can consider doing in public health as a student. And uh, I know Daniel mentioned uh, our book, but uh, uh, we get, I probably get an email every month at least from a student somewhere who wants to know how to do what we do. Uh, so we've had a, a a tremendously uh, adventurous and fulfilling. My wife and I both, uh, over the years, uh, ex uh, career. Uh, we continue to work uh, even at uh, at a, a more advanced age. Uh, and so today, I'm going to tell you, uh, give you some vignettes of various places we've worked, why we were there, what we did, 
um, and uh, and a, a, a occasional piece of data, but mostly just to tell you what what we were trying to do. These pictures give you a sense of the breadth of uh, where we were in Pakistan, Sudan, West Africa, and China, just to uh, and Brazil, to uh, just to name a few places. Now, I, uh, uh, as you heard, I did my undergraduate degree at Florida Southern College in chemistry and mathematics and uh, spent a lot of time in this building, which is a beautiful Frank Lloyd Wright design uh, science building at Florida Southern in Lakeland, Florida. Um, and I had a wonderful, absolutely wonderful experience. At the time of my graduation from undergraduate school, I was, it was the time of Sputnik. Most of you know about Sputnik and the, the early days of, of the satellites. Um, and uh, I turned down an offer for a, 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 a doctoral degree in, uh, in uh, physics uh, to go to Africa because I wanted to know more about what the world was like before I decided on exactly what my career Career was going to be. So I decided to take some time off. I went to Belgium to, uh, to study French and then came out to this uh, town called Wimunyama in the Congo uh, to teach uh, high school kids. Uh, these are Congolese high school kids, um, uh, chemistry, mathematics, and physics. Uh, after my first year there, I moved down to this school, which was a, a slightly larger school. Um, and continue to do uh, a similar one. I have lots of stories I could tell about this, my students and lines, but that's, uh, that's kind of what I did. This is actually me, just to show you the evidence that I was there. That's me teaching calculus and chemistry. That's our school building, and we didn't have, obviously, modern, uh, much in the way of modern facilities, but it was a very active life with, uh, with our Congolese students. Uh, I went on to, uh, at that time, I, uh, I did uh, get introduced to medicine out in the Congo. I took my medical college admission test out in the Congo, given by a missionary doctor who came later after I had gotten out there. And so was fortunate enough to be admitted to Duke University Medical School, where I did my uh, medical school training. I was a uh, I, I was sent by my mentor, Dr. Samuel Katz, who was chair of, Med of pediatrics, up to the Harvard School of Public Health, where I did both my third year of medicine and the School of Public Health degree. Uh, so one of the early students who did integrated degrees. Then I went on to Children's Hospital, where I did my residency in pediatrics, and then on to the Centers for Disease Control. Directly from there, I, I several people from the CDC were in my uh, in my Harvard School of Public Health class that turned me on to, to public health. Obviously, I've had the experience in, in, in Congo. And so I went on to the CDC to join the epidemiology service, uh, which was very uh, instrumental, obviously, in my uh, to help determine my career. Uh, so my first, I did many, many uh, investigations while I was an EIS officer. I, I, I will not have time to talk about any of those except this particular one. I was sent to, as the expert from uh, CDC to Brazil where there was a massive outbreak of meningococcal meningitis. Uh, and I was sent there to work with the Pan American Health Organization, the Brazilian government, to help uh, with, the, uh, with the control of this. Epidemic. Now, if you're not familiar with meningococcal meningitis, it's a pretty severe disease with relatively high mortality. It's, treated, it's a bacterial disease, so you can treat it with an antibiotic, but it has to be treated early. Otherwise, there are all kinds of complications like you see here. Sometimes this level of bleeding uh, ends up with uh, amputations. Uh, as you can see, the level of, and it covers really pretty much all ages. One of the major achievements of this time was the first really big, I'm talking 80 million people got vaccinated with a new vaccine, a polysaccharide vaccine uh, for meningococcal disease. And it was, it was produced by the Mario Foundation in France. Um, and Dr. Mario came to uh, Brazil. I interacted with him many times and then later, many times more, much later. Uh, uh, but as you can see, we were going around the country 
vaccinating even way up in the Amazon area. That's yours truly with our helicopter as we were going around to vaccinate people. And in those days, we used a vaccine gun, as you can see here. Uh, nowadays, uh, of course, we didn't know about hepatitis C and a lot of other things. So uh, it may not have been the best way to do it, but with 80 million people to vaccinate, uh, and there were about 150,000 cases of meningitis. And that's just a, an estimate. I'm sure there were many more than that that we never counted. But it was a huge outbreak. And I spent much of uh, two years work going back and forth working in Brazil. It was the largest in history of ANC meningitis. It was mixed for, as I said, the first mass vaccination of 80 million people. And the military, the Brazilian military is obviously very heavily involved in this. Vaccine efficacy turned out to be very high. We didn't know how it was going to be, but it turned out to be about 80% at least. Um, and uh, one of the issues about polysaccharide vaccine at the time was we knew it didn't work very well based on some preliminary data in children from six months to two years, and that was the case here. But it turns out we could vaccinate. We, we examined the uh, response to vaccine in children when their mothers had been uh, vaccinated in pregnancy. And it turned out it didn't cause tolerance, which was one of the worries. And that really established the fact that, uh, that um, pregnant women could be vaccinated with this, which means their, their uh, children would be, uh, have some antibody protection when they were born through the placental transmission of IgG antibody. So, um, then after uh, my time as an EIS officer, uh, I had the opportunity to go to West Africa. Uh, remember, I'd already had a time in the Congo. Well, here I went to Sierra Leone uh, in uh, West Africa. You see it's right here. And uh, to set up a program, a longitudinal pro program to study a disease called Lassa fever. It's a viral disease that is carried by a rodent called mastomies. Natalensis, and there's a picture of it. Um, this virus was first isolated in Nigeria in 1967, but it was known to be epidemic, or thought to be epidemic in West Africa. Uh, and so we went to set up a study site in Sierra Leone, in uh, Western Sierra Leone, uh, at this uh, place called Kenema, uh, to try to understand the epidemiology of this disease. What did that What did that entail? Well, we, we commandeered this building. Whoops, let me go back to that. We commandeered this building here, uh, which had no electricity and no running water, so we had to put that in. Uh, and then I had to train local staff to how to work in our laboratory, because we needed a laboratory, obviously, but also how to work uh, with patients, because we had to, our idea here was to, uh, was to look at patients who are coming to the local hospitals and try to figure out who had lost the fever. And what we learned from that was that it wasn't just epidemic, but it was in fact quite endemic. Now we, this, this is what we would call barrier nursing. It's what you would call uh, uh, isolation nursing uh, in, uh, in our modern hospital. But this was the best we could do in these, uh, these uh, rural hospitals in Sierra Leone, we wore gowns and masks uh, to protect ourselves because it is transmissible from person to person, as well as from rodent to person. Uh, here's this closer up picture here. And when we finished examining a patient, we would wash our gloved hands uh, in, uh, in, in Clorox, take off our gloves and hang them up so they could dry because we didn't have very many gloves and we could, had to reuse them. Masks the same way. So that's kind of the way we, uh, and I examined and took care of many, many patients under these circumstances. Loss of fever can be a very deadly disease. It causes a high fever. Um, and, uh, and many people uh, recover with, with a mild disease, but about 20% uh, get hospitalized. And out of those, uh, uh, sorry, about two to 3% of all cases get hospitalized. Uh, there are a lot of cases, as we learned, out in the, in the rural areas, and they never see hospital. But uh, when people do get hospitalized, about 15 to 20 percent of them uh, were fatal. Uh, so, and it looks like you get swelling and shock and all kinds of problems I won't go into here. And this is kind of one of the settings of uh, the village, uh, this village called Shigboema. And it's a pretty, very poor country. Sierra Leone is a really poor country. 
people are wonderful. We had, we ran this program for 15 years. I actually lived in Sierra Leone for three of those years uh, as we set up the program. Um, one of the things that loss of fever causes is deafness. People didn't realize that until we did, started to do our studies. And it turns out about a quarter of all the people who get uh, infected have some level of deafness following the disease. This happened to be a nurse who uh, became deaf in both ears after she was infected in the hospital. And this is our, uh, one of our uh, colleagues from, from uh, London who came down to work with us. And we were actually doing the study of uh, deafness, uh, bringing people in after they had the disease to uh, measure their, uh, their, um, their hearing levels. And so we were able to show that, in fact, this is a disease that causes quite frequent eighth nerve deafness. Um, one of the other things it does is uh, really affect uh, pregnant women. Um, and uh, when women get, pre get infected, pregnant women get infected with this, it's almost 100% fatal for the, for the uh, fetus. And if we don't uh, take the fetus out of the mother, it's almost 100% fatal for, for women as well. Now, when you're working in the BSL-4 laboratory, which we had back at CDC, and which uh, we have this more modernness, that's what it looks like. Uh, you saw what it looked like when we were working with patients in the field. It was a gown, a mask, and some, and some gloves, which we had to reuse. One of the things that we did, we did a couple of things. One was to uh, work on uh, a vaccine for loss of fever in our laboratory back at CDC. This is obviously after I returned from Sierra Leone. And we did a whole series of studies in primates. Uh, and we also did a clinical trial of ribavirin in, uh, in the field in Sierra Leone. And the conclusions from all this work was that we found the virus to be highly endemic it wasn't just epidemic, it was endemic, and in many, many rodents that particularly lived around houses, uh, people's houses, the transmission was from rodent urine to humans. Rodents are, are persistently infected, so they pretty much excrete virus throughout most of their life. It doesn't seem to affect them very much. There's also human-to-human -human transmission with close contact. It's not an airborne disease uh, virus. Uh, patients turned out to make about 13% of all hospitalized medical patients in that area. Uh, and as I said, there was a rigid residual deafness that was quite. Uh, we did a clinical trial of ribavirin and found that if you treated within five to six days of illness, it reduced the mortality from the 15 to 20% that I mentioned down to 5%. Um, and we found that when you uh, use a recombinant vaccine in our experimental work at CEC, that we could protect primates for two to three years with one dose of a vaccine. Uh, an inactivated vaccine was ineffective. This is our team, and they continue to work even when Sierra Leone, as many of you know, there was a terrible war, which really closed down our project after almost 15 years. We just couldn't work there anymore, but our team persisted and they continued to work with the hospitals uh, for a very long time. This was a visit that I made back in 1998 after many years of not being there and our team was still uh, together and active. So now let's move to Ebola virus. This was isolated at CDC and Porton Down in the UK and this is a picture of that, that Ebola virus. The first outbreak was at this mission hospital in uh, in uh, up in the uh, way up in the interior of uh, the Congo. Remember, I'd been a school teacher there, so I was pretty familiar with it. My area, as I showed you, was down here where I was teaching, but this occurred way up in the northern part of the Congo, which is an extremely uh, distant uh, area from the capital, which is Kinshasa down here. Um, Ebola, again, is a hemorrhagic fever like loss of fever. It causes acute fever. Uh, marked uh, weight loss. Uh, it causes uh, people to uh, have an incredibly sore throat and, and uh, um, uh, sore chest pains, uh, abdominal pains, often vomiting. There is bleeding that occurs, though patients don't bleed to death. They go into shock, what we call a hypovolemic shock, and that's, what, that's really is the fatal part of this. Uh, Ebola is well known to you because we had this huge outbreak. And once again, this time when we were doing the Ebola outbreak, that's the kind of gear that we wore in the field. 
Uh, and this again is what you wear when you're working in the laboratory in there. Now we had to get from Kinshasa, I showed you that map where the capital was in the north, and this was the road up there. Uh, fortunately, we were able to fly up there. And one of my assignments was in fact to take a Zaire, Zaire Air Force uh, plane up to Kisangani. And from there, I took a, a Land Rover all the way up to Southern Sudan, because it turns out there was a second outbreak, simultaneous outbreak of the same disease. Remember, we had to define the disease and we didn't know what it was uh, until they isolated it at CDC. Um, this was uh, showing us putting our Land Rover in, uh, into uh, this, uh, this C-141 to fly up to, or C-130 rather, flying up to, uh, to Kisangani. Uh, and uh, we, it was a tough ride between Kisangani and uh, Southern Sudan. It uh, was a difficult road. We had to put our, often put our uh, Land Rover on a makeshift ferry like this uh, to get across. I got out of the vehicle for this one because I wasn't sure about this ferry and I didn't want to end up in, if we went into the river, I just wanted to be in my vehicle. Um, but I took, this is the, bar, this is the uh, frontier between uh, Congo and the Sudan. And this was a local uh, 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 fellow who helped me with translation because I was going from French and Lingala and he spoke in Zandi which was the, the local language here, but he also spoke French and, and uh, Lingala. So between the two of us, we could communicate and he helped me get across the border up into Sudan where I met this physician who was trying to also take care of, of patients. Unfortunately, most of the patients had died and the rest of them fled because of the high mortality and the fear uh, that, uh, that this disease, and at this point, we did not know what it was. We just knew we thought it was a viral disease. We had to go out into the into this area on foot uh, through these uh, through this area of very high grass, looking for patients out of the villages because no one wanted to bring their patient who was sick into uh, the, the makeshift clinic there. Um, so that was a real adventure in itself. We had this was one of the survivors we found in the village, 27 year old woman who uh, had survived Ebola. Um, and it shows you she had a massive weight loss, which is why she looks so thin here. Uh, this was the sister of the, uh, and the, the uh, brother-in-law of the first index case. And this is yours truly talking with them in Southern Sudan. Um, it turns out that the culprit for much of the epidemic in Yambuku and in the Congo, and to some degree in Sudan was the back needle transmission where index case came in contaminated needles, uh, they, that person was, uh, was inoculated with some uh, chlor uh, with, uh, chloroquine from thought to have malaria because he had headache and a fever. But what happened was it contaminated needles and those got uh, used and reused because they didn't have a way to, uh, to sterilize their needles. And so as people came in, particularly pregnant women who came in and got their injections of of vitamins and whatever that was considered important for pre for uh, prenatal care. Uh, this virus got transmitted from uh, in, into them, but with a needle, and they went back into villages and transmitted to other people. Again, it requires quite close contact. It's not airborne. Um, and as I said, there were 318 cases, 280 deaths in the case fatality in Yambuku was 88%. It was a little bit lower in, uh, in Sudan. Um, and needles exposure, the case fatality was 100%. Um, and this kind of shows you the epi curve. For those of you who are all familiar, I'm sure, with epi curves. The blue was needle transmission, and you can see how that reflects what I described. People got their uh, injection at the clinic. Uh, thinking they were getting something good, went back, spread it to people in their family, and the red is the one person to person. The, the yellow is uh, both people who people are exposed to needle, but also to person to person. So that shows you classically the uh, way the, the uh, virus was transmitted. Now, after that experience, I became uh, the chief of the special pathogens branch. Uh, and the director of the biosafety lab uh, for the bio BSL-4 lab uh, at the CDC in 1980. 
Um, and I also oversaw the construction of a much larger, more sophisticated laboratory, which is what you see here in 1988. Uh, today, they've built a, uh, new laboratories. So one of the opportunities I had as a, uh, as, uh, in this capacity was uh, to go to, back to the Congo to do the very first investigation of HIV uh, in Central Africa. And again, we went to, to Kinshasa to, uh, to investigate HIV in two hospitals in, uh, in Kinshasa. Um, and we asked the question, where did HIV come from? When I did this investigation in 1983, we did not have a virus, very similar to what you saw with Ebola. So we had to use uh, other means to identify people that we suspected to have uh, what was called lymphadenopathy syndrome at the time or uh, human Im uh, immunodeficiency uh, syndrome. Uh, so we were trying to understand uh, this outbreak. Uh, what, first of all, was there a disease here? Uh, and we, we looked in this 2000 bed hospital, this huge hospital, which is pictures of it here, in, uh, in Mami Ewa Hospital. And we started looking at patients, examining patients. We took blood samples and then we did CD4, C8 ratios in the afternoon. I took all my lab equipment out with me and we were able to identify people with, with clearly with uh, uh, what was obviously HIV. Here are some pictures of three of those patients. You can see how, weight, how much weight loss they had lost, they had, how Ill, they were really quite ill. And uh, this was what AIDS looked like in 1983 in Kinshasa. Uh, what we found was that AIDS was, AIDS was widespread in Kinshasa. The sex ratio, which was what was new, was one to one. So that really strongly suggested heterosexual transmission. And that caused a lot of controversy when I went back to the US because it was thought to be a gay person's disease at that time. And uh, we pointed out this was heterosexual transmission without question. Um, and uh, TB and fungal diseases were really common in this group. We started then a long-term project, which lasted many years in Kinshasa as a result of that. Um, we, uh, I'm gonna skip over this slide. This just shows you, in fact, that we, well, no, I won't skip over it because we went back up to where we had investigated Ebola in the Northern part of uh, Congo. Uh, and this is what it looks like, just some pictures of it as you've seen. And we went back to, uh, to Yambuku and to other areas because we wanted to see what was the, what did HIV look back like in 1976? How did we know that? I had 659 serum specimens from people from 1976 Ebola epidemic in my freezer at CDC. And our question was, did we see HIV back then? The answer was yes. In 1976, the, the uh, prevalence of uh, HIV was between 0.1 and 1.4% uh, of the population. Um, and uh, in 1986, our hypothesis was that, uh, that in the rural areas, this was endemic. It was not epidemic like we were seeing in the cities. And indeed, when we get followed up 10 years later, with another uh, survey of 388 people, almost identical prevalence. So this shows you that it was, this was the first study like this showing you this was endemic and not epidemic. Whereas when we looked at hospitalized patients in Kinshasa and in female prostitutes in a nearby bigger city, prevalence was much, much higher. And of course, the, where did this come from? In the rural areas, mainly from this, from bushmeat where uh, the, particularly with chimpanzees and human primates, we now know, and I don't have time to go into all that detail, but you can read about it, uh, that this is what, where it got transmitted. Later on, I had the opportunity to work with a, a disease called hantavirus. You may know it by Four Corners virus because it occurred uh, in the United States. Uh, it became known as Four Corners disease. But we actually isolated this virus and identified it in my laboratory at the CDC uh, in 1982. And this opened the door for, uh, for, it was created the first cell culture and opened the door for a lot more work to go on. Uh, we did a lot of work with hepatitis C uh, and Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever in Pakistan. 
uh, we had we examined an outbreak of jaundice in uh, in in this area of Pakistan. This is where Karachi is, the cap, the uh, one of the large the largest city, and uh, but way up north was where we saw this outbreak of jaundice that was reported to us. Uh, we did an investigation uh, survey within the uh, within the town of uh, it's called Hafizabad. Um, and uh, what we were able, able to determine was uh, that, uh, in fact, it was through, again, once again, through needle transmission uh, in clinics that we were seeing hepatitis C transmission. So the jaundice was actually chronic hepatitis C, and uh, it was through needle transmission. That's all published. We published all that work. Uh, there is a tick-borne virus in this area called Congo, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Uh, and uh, while we were at the Aga Khan University, where we were for four years in Karachi, we were brought two, two surgeons came in with uh, high fever and bleeding, and uh, we diagnosed them with hemorrhagic fever, Congo, Congo crime hemorrhagic fever. This is the operating room where they had gotten infected by operating on a on a shepherd who came in who had uh, high fever but was bleeding and vomiting blood, they decided to operate and they got infected. Um, and so uh, we were able to treat them with ribavirin, which is, if you recall, we had used in Sierra Leone, and indeed um, they survived. So that was a real adventure. Here are some of our students uh, from the Akan University up and way up in Baluchistan, where we're chasing Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever looking for it in rural areas, because we know that it's a tick-borne disease often involved with, uh, with sheep and goat herding. Uh, and this is a typical, this is the, I took this picture myself. So we're way up in the interior of Baluchistan near the Iranian border uh, and working with nomads in that area, looking to see, this is one of our students uh, speaking with, uh, he spoke the language, the local language. So what we learned once again was a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing because the, the, um, the, the vehicles of both of those diseases turned out to be in the hospital, in the clinic using needles and syringes, or in the case of the operating room, um, uh, uh, scalpels. So later on, uh, my wife and I were uh, giving some seminars and setting up a treatment for loss of fever in, uh, in uh, Liberia. Uh, and this is my wife uh, giving an instruction. We were uh, working with people setting up a laboratory and lo and behold, we were invaded by some rebels. And uh, if you're familiar with the wars that were going on at that time in uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone. And we ended up getting evacuated out of that along with some other uh, uh, workers, uh, aid workers, from that remote area of Sierra Leone with a Russian helicopter and a Russian uh, crew who, uh, who uh, let's see, yeah, whoops. I'm sorry, I've got jumped ahead somehow. I'm not sure how I did that. Anyway, that we ended up being uh, being evacuated in this Russian helicopter. We went down to like to Monrovia, the capital, and uh, encountered uh, rabies in cats down there, and had to help uh, sort out our problems with rabies in cats. So you never know when you're working in this part of the world what you're going to encounter. You kind of have to be ready for everything. Okay, so then we went. Went from, from Pakistan to Lyon, France in 1997 and to the uh, Institut Pasteur in Paris, where I was a professor and started the program for epidemiology. My wife, on the other hand, built this high, uh, oversaw the building and the, the, uh, uh, the inauguration of this large BSL-4 laboratory uh, for which she received the Legion d'honneur from the president of France. We went from here to uh, Brownsville. And that's where we had to start our campus in Brownsville, the regional campus. This is the regional campus. Uh, as I mentioned, the School of Public Health in Texas uh, at uh, UT Health uh, Houston actually has six campuses. One of them, the smallest one is in Brownsville. It's a beautiful campus, as you can see. 
Um, and uh, that's where we started in 2001. We founded the campus. This building did not exist. We had to oversee the construction of it. Uh, and to start our school and recruit students and start a research program, there were no medical research programs in the region when we started, when we founded this campus. Um, I was honored uh, in 2003 with the James H. Steele professorship. This is Jim Steele at age 100 uh, on his 100th birthday and yours truly talking with him. I knew Jim for many, many years because he was also at CDC when I was there as an EI officer and later on. So it was a great honor and continues to be a great honor for me to carry his name. Jim was the originator of the One Health concept because he was a veterinarian, but he understood the, co the close relationship between uh, animal health and human health. And he conceived of the idea of One Health, a wonderful human being. He lived to be about 103 uh, and uh, was as sharp as a tack here. Um, and uh, I, I really uh, have been very grateful for having that opportunity. So we set up that campus that you can see. Uh, this is my wife again. This is our staff now uh, that we recruited to set up our big research program, which is a population health uh, research program, trying to measure the level of underlying chronic conditions. So we went from hot viruses to chronic diseases by going to, um, to uh, Brownsville. And uh, we set up a clinical research uh, unit in the Edelstein building, which is next to our hospital in Brownsville. Here is our staff that goes out to recruit people randomly from the population. Uh, this is one of the encounters of our folks uh, at enrolling someone in our research project. Here is our director. She's been with us now for 18 years. Uh, and she runs the clinical research unit. All of our staff, were recruited from our community. They're all bilingual. None of them had this kind of experience. In fact, most of them were not in, even involved in medicine uh, and not trained in medicine. Nevertheless, they are absolutely fabulous at what they do, which is to recruit people, come in and, uh, and do a whole series of, of, uh, of tests and, uh, and um, everything from eye exams to DEXA exams to uh, ultrasounds, they do it all. And uh, so we have now enrolled 5,000 people into this very large study. Um, we also created our research laboratory. Here's our research laboratory. Marcella Morris has been with us for 13 years. Uh, Marcella, well, we recruited her right out of her undergraduate degree in chemistry. She had zero experience at a clinical lab. She's now a world-class expert at running this laboratory. She is fantastic. Um, we have state-of-the-art equipment. We've been fortunate to be funded. Um, uh, this is our more current picture of our staff, including our, our, our clinical research unit staff, our lab staff, and our data management team, which we have all of these, which we have to have because we have a huge uh, data database now with our, uh, with our uh, cohort. So here is a, 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 an investigation we did with the county health department in 2009. All of you were member H1N1. Well, we were right on the border, of course. Uh, Brownsville is, uh, I can walk from our campus to, to Tech Mexico in about seven to 10 minutes. So that's how close we are to the, to the border. Um, and we were experienced among the earliest cases of H1N1. We, we met with our county health department. We created a data team. Uh, our, here are some of our students working on this project. Uh, and this, this is a picture of all of the county staff and our staff working together over a series of several weeks as we set up our surveillance system. And we were able to deliver some of the earliest data on H1N1 to NIH and to Baylor, our, our collaborator. Uh, through this, uh, this uh, program. We're able to set up a surveillance lit uh, program literally within 48 hours uh, using SurveyMonkey to get data in, our team to analyze the data, to uh, enter and analyze the data. And then we sent out community health workers 
to go out to, into the community to help advise people and educate them about what to do about uh, H, about uh, potential influenza. So that was, uh, uh, and we published several papers out of that. So we've been working in this community now for 21 years. We've established um, a huge programs. We have brought in over a hundred million dollars into this community over this period of time. And much of that has gone to out into community outreach programs, uh, building uh, walking trails, biking trails, playgrounds, community gardens, and the Brownsville, the poorest, at that time, the poorest city in the United States was the first city in Texas to ever win the Robert Wood Johnson Cultural Health Award in 2014. Uh, and it was through our partnership with the city that we were able to do this. And uh, it's, it's starting to transform the city uh, amazingly. So that was our purpose. I'm gonna wind up by talking about giving you a summary of what we've been able to do uh, in our county, uh, in our surrounding area. Uh, we've set up a COVID surveillance using GIS, a spatial analysis with, uh, with uh, in, in the county. We use, uh, did this in the whole county. Uh, we worked with colleagues in Houston who are experts at spatial analysis. We published now several papers on this. Uh, out of this experience, but more importantly, provide this data to the city and the county, and they have boots on the ground. So we provided them with maps about where cases occurring, where is testing occurring. They were able to go out and use those maps to try to uh, increase the, uh, the surveillance in areas and increase testing. Um, but we also, because of our, our clinical research unit, have some pretty amazing work going on uh, using doing the following uh, following the COVID long haul syndrome, and at the moment we are in the middle of analyzing data, and we found that there are four. Uh, we actually look at gene expression changes. Remember, we have all this cohort of people uh, that we are studying over the many years now since 2004. We actually have RNA sequen uh, sequencing before uh, they got COVID and after. We have a methylation that we can follow because we have serial DNA samples. And we're, we've been able to identify four genes that were significantly changed following COVID in people in our cohort. Uh, we're currently doing, continuing to do the studies of long haul syndrome, trying to measure uh, both uh, mental health changes, uh, uh, changes in, in, in cognition and depression and many other things, as well as cardiovascular measurements in this population. So we have an ongoing, this, and this is collaboration with uh, Vanderbilt, uh, with our, our, our uh, medical school in Houston, and with the University of North Carolina. Uh, we have extensive studies of cardiovascular disease, which we published with our colleagues here in Houston. I'm sitting in the, in the uh, I'm giving this presentation from the chair of medicine and the head of cardiology's uh, <laughs> conference room. He's one of our major collaborators. Uh, we're looking at obesity and lipid disorders in our, in our cohort. And these are clinical and genetic studies with Vanderbilt and University of North Carolina. We have metabolic disease studies also going on with the same collaborators. We have two NIH grants with MD Anderson uh, on liver disease and liver cancer, which is a huge issue in our population. Uh, we have a clinical trial, NIH supported clinical trial treating prediabetes with semiglutides. It's an ongoing study in our clinical research unit here in Brownsville. Uh, we have a major program in tuberculosis and diabetes. We found out many years ago that, in fact, uh, uh, diabetes is the major risk factor for tuberculosis in our population. We're establishing a whole series of studies of brain health in our population. And as I mentioned, we've published uh, pretty widely. We have over 100 papers published from this work. And we are really helping to define the underlying uh, uh, conditions, chronic disease conditions in our cohort. And we brought in over $100 million. Most of that has gone to community outreach programs, not to our research programs. So with that, I will uh, stop here and, uh, and uh, maybe stop sharing. Let's see if I can stop sharing my, my screen here. Um, let's see. Can you see me now?
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I will stop there and, and be happy to entertain questions. I know that was a very rapid to run through a lot of different things, but I just wanted to give you a, all of these kinds of, uh, of adventures. They're still available. They're still possible. So it just depends on how energetic and adventurous and imaginative you might want to be as a as a uh, as a student of public health, because there's a lot of public health out there to be done. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. Um, I'll hand it over here to Dr. McKinney, and I'm going to share my screen while um, we wrap up and then open it up for questions. Dr. McCormick, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and uh, for sharing your experience and perspective on your 50 plus years in the field of global public health. Thank you to all who have joined us as well this afternoon, including our university colleagues, alumni, students, and state and local public health professionals. Before we conclude and open up to questions and answers, we'd like to virtually present Dr. McCormick with a very small token of our appreciation. And uh, here it is on behalf of the University of Louisville School of Public Health, Information Sciences and the Student Government Association will be sending Dr. McCormick a genuine Louisville slugger bat because he's uh, hit it out of the park with his presentation today. Uh, Dr. Blakely um, uh, here is pictured with uh, an image of his own Louisville slugger bat. So this is the type that you'll be receiving Dr. McCormick uh, with the inscription there um, uh, based on your presentation today. I know we're running short on time, but we uh, have graciously heard from, from Dr. McCormick that he's agreed to stay uh, a little past the hour if necessary to answer any questions you might have. And Paige will be monitoring and moderating uh, the Q&A from the participant questions via the chat room. So uh, Paige, please. We, um, uh, for everyone else, we'd like to um, uh, acknowledge again your our appreciation for you taking time to be with us and hope to see you all again on April the 20th as we welcome Dr. Stephen Luby, Professor Associate Dean of uh, Global Health Research at Stanford University School of Medicine, uh, who will be talking to us about another uh, hot topic in the, uh, the field of global public health. Hey. So could I just say a word here? Yes. Dr. Luby, uh, I brought Dr. Luby out to Pakistan as a young, EI, as a young uh, physician, and he was the one who uh, spearheaded that study of hepatitis C. Dr. Luby spent uh, several years uh, with us in Pakistan. In fact, he stayed on after I left. I think he published probably 40 papers, and that's really the experience that launched his career. Uh, in the area of uh, uh, that he works on, which has a lot to do with water and uh, clean water. Uh, but uh, yes, Dr. Luby is a longtime friend, uh, a mentee, and uh, I'm delighted to see that. And I see you also have Sten Vermund on the list. Absolutely. And Sten, yes. uh, when he was still at Alabama before he became, before he went to Vanderbilt and to uh, Yale, uh, worked with us on HIV out in Pakistan. So you're bringing in some of our, our friends and colleagues. Fantastic. It's most appropriate to have this group of uh, very distinguished speakers then uh, in the, the Woods and Lectureship for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said, feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat. I will be monitoring. Um, and I'll go ahead and start us off. We had a couple of questions that were pre-submitted. So um, one of our attendees asked, uh, they're curious about your role of mapping and medical geography as it pertains to the breadth and depth of your career. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I have shown you some maps. I, we didn't do, uh, in those days, we did not have, have the opportunity to do any kind of uh, spatial mapping or GIS that didn't exist. In fact, when I was, um, most of the time there, I, I didn't even have a, I had no, no radio, I sorry, no telephone and often only a shortwave radio at best. So trying to do GIS mapping or any kind of thing like that, we do a lot of that nowadays uh, in our work in, uh, in Brownsville, but uh, the, we had no, no tools like that at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, the one time that I, uh, one of the times that I flew in a small plane in the condo, 
uh, the pilot was uh, navigating with a uh, Michelin map uh, because there were no other, uh, there's no other way to do it. He got lost for a while. So it was a little bit of, uh, of white knuckle time until we figured out where we were. All right, thank you. And the second one we had come in is, um, do you have any recommendations for someone who's interested in epi but doesn't feel smart enough? Um, you know, there are lots of, uh, you can now, you, Google is such a great, uh, the internet is such a great tool because you can go find out, find uh, descriptions uh, and uh, of epidemiology at the very basic level. And so I would definitely encourage you to do that. Much of our, our epidemiology for those of us who are older really is more arithmetic than it is anything that complicated. And we used to say that if you can't show, if you can't prove it by a two by two table, it probably isn't significant. So, uh, so it's not as complicated as you might think. And just uh, kind of dip your toe in the water, use the internet, that would be my advice uh, to get yourself familiar with it. And there are lots of exciting reports on it using epidemiology. Much of what I reported to you that did not use sophisticated uh, analytical tools. We didn't have them. Uh, but it was uh, still, uh, able, we were able to demonstrate the kinds of findings that we, uh, that we showed with some pretty basic surveys and a bit of arithmetic. Thank you. Um, and we had one come into the chat from Rochelle. They um, asked, what virus tracking lessons from COVID-19 can we apply to the newly detected outbreak of polio in the East African country of Malawi? And how is virus tracking in low and middle income countries the same or different? So it's kind of a two part question. Yeah, so um, the one of the efforts, of course, we everybody knows that smallpox was was uh, eradicated. The last case was in in Somalia in 1976. Many of us who are older, I was not one of the troopers who worked with smallpox, but many others have been. Uh, and uh, so that was a great achievement. Polio uh, eradication has been ongoing now for well over 20 years. And uh, the, the efforts to eradicate it are much more complicated than they were with uh, smallpox. Smallpox, you had good markers because you got, you got uh, lesions on the skin and you could find cases. Polio is more complicated. It's an enteric virus and so it's silent. You don't know if it's in the water or food or whatever. And it can be carried by someone totally asymptomatically. So it has made it complicated. Um, the, uh, more recently, the, uh, the, um, uh, the last two countries that, uh, and you can imagine why, that people thought there was polio, uh, any polio and eradication programs had been going on for a long time, were Pakistan and Afghanistan um, because of the wars and the, and the complexity of getting up into that area. So having an outbreak, uh, and, and there was a, a lot of transmission going on for a while in Nigeria, but most people thought it was now eradicated. So having it crop up in some other place now is really problematic. And I think it will uh, raise the issue about how well we can, um, we can really eradicate this virus. Surveillance for it is difficult in a country like Malawi, which is a very, very poor country. Uh, there is a labor, uh, you know, there is a laboratory effort, but again, this is a country with with uh, a, a lot of, of issues that will relate to sanitation and hygiene, and that's the perfect setup for an enteric virus like polio. So, doing the surveillance, uh, tracking it down, is going to be a real challenge. And the question is, where did it come from? Thank you. And we just had one more come in. Um, so as those regions are not only infested by all of the described conditions, but mostly invaded by endless war conflicts, would you advise new public health folks to still fly there today? To fly which where now? Um, I'm not sure. Um, you could provide- Areas of conflict, is that? Yeah, um, those that have endless, like, lots of war going on as well. So I think well, I mean, it's always, you know, I think that's always an issue. I have been, uh, I mean, I didn't describe this, but I was under uh, curfew for, with a war going on in Sierra Leone when I first got there. Um, Pakistan was a constant uh, issue of violence. 
uh, one day I arrived at our at our uh, university uh, one morning to to my office at our university. University at Cotton County University, and there was a van there with, that had been uh, full of bullet holes, and uh, there were four people who were uh, four people from Americans from the uh, from the embassy, uh, sorry, from the consulate who had been attacked. Uh, two ended up dying, and they were all on the operating table when I got in there. And so, um, you know, and I've been stopped by people at at, in, in very many parts of Africa, at barriers with soldiers, sometimes intoxicated. Um, hey, you know, it's, uh, it's part of what can be. Uh, on the other hand, uh, most of my time in these countries, people have been wonderful. And, uh, you know, you take risks everywhere. Uh, and uh, I think you have to weigh the risk of violence uh, and the risk of, uh, probably the risk of violence in these war areas may be much more than the risk of infection. Um, and so, and nowadays you get vaccinated against so many different things, including Ebola, by the way. So, you know, uh, go for it. If it's, if it's up in somewhere in, the, in Congo or someplace where there's Ebola outbreak, you know, get vaccinated and head, head out there. Thank you. Um... Looks like I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so I know that you've agreed to um, share your PowerPoint. And like I said, we're recording this so we can, um, we'll share this out to anybody who missed it uh, or anybody wants to pass it along. I believe Dr. McKinney will be sharing this with uh, KY Train. We'll be putting this up on their um, website for availability to, the, to its members. So, um, Again, thank you. It doesn't look like we've had any more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. And um... so let me just say thank you very much for the Louisville Slugger bat. <laughs> I went to many baseball games in Louisville uh, to see at that time, wasn't it the Louisville Cardinals that were, was the, uh, the baseball Redbirds. team? The Redbirds. Redbirds, sorry, not Cardinals. That's I know it's U of L. Yeah, Redbirds. That's right. I went to many of their games uh, as a as a, as a young person. Uh, you know, I was only 15 miles away from Louisville, so I'm extremely familiar with with Louisville Slugger, and I played uh, uh, baseball as a high school student. So thank you so much. So Paige, can I ask one question at the end? Oh yeah, go ahead. So, uh, Dr. McCormick, you you relate in detail your experience in, um, I believe it was then Zaire, 1976. Um, that was a banner year in infectious diseases uh, in many different ways. Of course, the big outbreak of Legionnaires' disease occurred in the summer of 76. We had the scare about swine flu appearing and so forth, and the subsequent concerns as well about uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome and the recipients of swine flu vaccine. So, were you able to keep uh, in touch with all the other activities going on by, uh, of CDC stateside when you were abroad? So, um, so in 1976, I was just getting ready to start the program in Sierra Leone. I had finished much of my work in Brazil. So my, my, uh, my good friend uh, and mentor at that time, or our co actually colleague, was David Fraser. And David was one of the pioneers in working on Legionellas, Legionella, and uh, did much of the, uh, he was led the team from CDC uh, to, um, to uh, uh, try to define Legionella. At that time, it was a new disease. My wife is the one who uh, discovered Legionella in the UK, and she is the one who showed that it wasn't in, in as she will tell you, it's, it wasn't in air conditioning, it was in the showers. And she can give you stories of crawling around in, with uh, an engineer um, in, uh, in the, in the uh, heating elements and the, the pipes of the, of the hospital to try to figure out where it was uh, and collecting gallons of water and, and putting them on a, on a uh, cart and hauling them back to her lab from the hospital to try to isolate Legionella. And what they, what they finally found was that it was growing in the bottom of the, uh, of the tanks, of the heating tanks. Uh, and uh, that's why when you first turned on the, the hot showers, 
to, to heat up the water and you would start to get a lot of Legionella coming out because it was lying in there. So she published all of that and we met because she was brought to, she came over to CDC to give a talk about that disease. So between her and David Fraser, yes, I did keep up. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, a, of a swine flu, it was interesting because uh, the CDC actually invited one of my colleagues that I worked with in Brazil to come up to CDC to talk about their, their experience with uh, mass vaccination. Because at that time, uh, that we were considering uh, uh, whether there might have to be a vaccination, a mass vaccination campaign in the United States for, H, for, for influenza. And so that our, my colleague who was heavily involved in organizing that and overseeing it came up from Brazil to talk about their experience with it. And uh, one of my uh, EIS officer colleagues and former EIS officer colleagues, uh, Larry Schoenberger, Schoenberger was one of the uh, work on, uh, on influenza and particularly on the Guillaume-Barre question. So he was sort of the, the lo our local expert on, on Guillaume-Barre. Guillaume-Barre has turned out to be a question in, in, in COVID as well. I'm not sure that we have nailed anything down about it, but uh, yeah, the answer is yes, I was heavily involved in all sorts of things. And you're right, it was a, really a banner year for, uh, and it was, of course, I went out to set up the program on loss of fever in, in West Africa. And I, that's where I got it now. Now, Paul, this was Telex. You're, you're, you're old enough to know that we used to have Telexes. <laughs> so the embassy got a Telex for me. I was about 200 miles inland. The embassy got a telex about this outbreak in the Congo, uh, and people, of course, knew I was in West Africa, and uh, could I maybe help with this? And so um, they they sent a driver up. We didn't have a telephone up where I was, so they sent a driver up with this telex, and I went back to then to the embassy down down to the to the American embassy in Freetown in Sierra Leone. And then organized to take my, I had a little field isolator where you could work with things in, the, in with, with gloves and isolate your, whatever you're working with inside the isolator. It had a, a, a filter system and all that. So I packed it up and uh, took it to, uh, to Congo. But to get there, because there were no direct flights, I had to go to Abidjan. I had no visa for Abidjan. So I, uh, fortunately, I spoke French. And I was able to uh, to cajole my way into so that I could catch a flight then from Abidjan uh, uh, down to um, to uh, Cameroon, and then I had to, to also talk my way into there because I had no chance to get a visa there and explain what I was doing and uh, again and then try to catch a flight from the Cameroon to the Congo. So it took me three days, actually four days, to get down to the Congo. Uh, and then when I got there, they tried to get me to pay, uh, pay um, uh, for, the, uh, for the excise tax on bringing equipment into the Congo. So that was typical. I was already aware of that. I knew that would happen because they always try to extort money from you when you go in. So I said, well, guys, if you want to, I said, here, you can just keep the equipment here and I'll go in and get to find somebody. So no, 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 we don't want to, no, don't do that. <laughs> So yes, that was my adventure from from uh, trying to get down to to help with the Ebola outbreak uh, after I got set up. And this was, uh, I guess, I got out to the to Sierra Leone in in late July, or early September, or sorry, uh, late August, early September, and uh, went almost immediately then to the Congo for for that outbreak. So it was a pretty adventurous year all the way around. Uh, um. I actually Sorry had, for the long-winded answer, but yeah. <laughs> you're, you're fine. That's great. No, I actually had one more um, question come in that I want to share. And then it was also, I dropped something in the chat um, before everybody signs off that if you were one of the first 50 registrations, uh, you should have gotten an email from Daniel Malik um, to coordinate pickup of Dr. McCormick's book. We have 50 copies of those. Um, if you weren't one of the first 50 registered and did want to be added to a wait list in case we have any extras, feel free to email Daniel as well and uh, we'll put you on the wait list. So um, we had a question coming from Nina. Um, she wants to know, if, I'm not sure, oh, sorry. Um, what, emerges, what emerging infectious diseases should we be on the lookout for? Well, I think most of us uh, were, uh, were uh, 
amazed by by the by the coronavirus outbreak. I mean, I think that was most of us thought that flu influenza would be would be um, uh, would be our next big that we would see some kind of mutation, eventual mutation of influenza that would replicate what we saw. Uh, maybe even in, in 2000, in 1918. Uh, so I think most of us thought that would be. Um, it, it was interesting that in 2014, when the big outbreak occurred in Ebo with Ebola, I was obviously already heavily involved in, in Brownsville, so I didn't try to get involved to go out to West Africa. There were plenty of people, uh, young people who wanted the experience. But I did spend a, quite a bit of time on uh, with CNN, about 10 days in New York, trying to help uh, people understand. I remember the first, um, the first uh, uh, time I was on the program with Anderson Cooper, uh, he, was, he was talking about you know, the, the experience. He knew I would, he had learned that I had had experience with Ebola, which is why they asked me to be one of their commentators. Anyway, I said, look, Anderson, we're never gonna have an outbreak of Ebola in the, in the U.S., there's no way. I said I, I I lived in Sierra Leone. I know what the circumstances are. We don't have anything like that. You couldn't find a place uh, that looks like that in the U.S. Yes, we could have a couple of cases. We ended up with that in Texas, as you know. Uh, a guy came over from Liberia with uh, with Ebola. He was seen at the Presbyterian Hospital in uh, in Dallas. And to my utter amazement, he was sent home after uh, presenting with the classic picture of Ebola. Uh, they sent him home and uh, then he came back, of course, Moribon was taken care of in the hospital and our two nurses got infected. What was amazing, and I kept pointing out to the people that while he was home, he was really critically ill with his family one of his relatives was a licensed, uh, an LVN, uh, a, you know, a, just a, 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 a really relatively lower level training of nursing. Uh, and she, she knew enough about how to care for him without getting, you have to, you have to come in contact. It's not airborne. It was not airborne. So I put, kept pointing out, nobody in his family got infected. Nobody. He got hospitalized, two nurses got it because the, pro the protocol for handling this was absolutely terrible. Sorry about that. The protocol was absolutely terrible. And so, uh, <laughs> so that's how they got infected. And so I was still working with CNN. And I remember Sanjay Gupta and I having a discussion about that on there about the fact that this was a failure of, of the hospital system, not uh, the fact that we were going to have an outbreak of Ebola. Anyway, that was one of my experiences. I still think influenza, but now we're living in the era of COVID. And I think the question everybody asks now is, are we going to continue to have to live with COVID? And it looks like we will for a while until we can sort it out. Uh, I think I've given four, four webinars now on just on COVID alone uh, to, in various venues. And uh, all I can say is, uh, we're 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 going to be living with this for a while. Already, we've got uh, Omicron two, um, Omicron B two that looks like it is more infectious than Omicron one, and is starting to be seen now in large numbers in Japan. There's big out big report a couple of days ago from Japan about this, uh, and in South Africa again. So uh, so I think. Uh, we're going to be living with this for a while. Are there, and there's also the, the, the question about whether we're going to see this in, in, an, in, a, in a reservoir, an animal reservoir. Already white-tailed deer have been identified. The uh, wastewater surveillance in New York has identified uh, COVID, uh, 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 coronaviruses that are COVID-like, but that are not human. So now the speculation, are they coming from rodents in the, in the sewer system? Where's that coming from? So I think we're, you know, I've given, as I said, I've given four webinars on this and I can guarantee you every webinar has been different because we learned between each one of them, we've learned so much new stuff that you just have to go in and say, well, I don't know, that's no longer valid. Here's what we've learned. So uh, as we have 7 billion people on the planet, 
And these mega cities with huge populations, it's far easier to transmit viruses than it's ever been from human to human. And so I think um, it's hard to see how we're going to, uh, to avoid having other viruses emerge. Um, and, and if you were in, in my book, one of the leading uh, comments uh, that we made up was, in the world of viruses, we are the invaders. So the more we get into the areas where viruses live, i.e. where Ebola live in, lives in bats and, and Lhasa lives in, 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 uh, in, in uh, rodents and uh, coronaviruses live in bats, um, we are likely to continue to see because viruses are continuing to, to evolve and uh, the more we come in contact with them, there's no reason to think we aren't going to see other ones that emerge. It, that, you know, that's the way I see it. But flu still remains, uh, I think, looming on the horizon, partly because of the huge population we have now and the proximity of people to each other. Anything you can put out there that is person-to-person -person transmission, I think, is a risk. All right. Well, I appreciate it. It looks like that was uh, the last question we had. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. And again, thank you for uh, giving us your time today. I know we had a lot, of, uh, quite a bit to attend and we're excited for this presentation. So again, thank you for your time.